and welcome back, friends. We're so glad you've joined us. Uh, this is Ridgeview's podcast where we try to cover everything hope, healing, and recovery related. It's always uh, very special and neat when we can have guests from outside the agency, but our key partners with us uh, join us. So, my dear friend, Catherine Brunson, it's so good to see you, not like on the TV screen where we're in so many community Ab- meetings. Absolutely, so. absolutely. I, You know, a couple years ago when we first got started before COVID, I used to say, oh, there's my brother Michael, because we were at like almost every, the same thing every single week. It's like, hey there, how are you? Yep. How are you? So I hope we get back to that really soon. Uh, maybe this is an indication we're kind of leaning into it. I know that in the circles I'm traveling, yeah, somehow your name still comes up with the same level of frequency. So, yeah, maybe we're not far off. So, it's great to have you. This is an important uh, topic. Uh, So, first, I guess, tell us a little bit about who you are and what your role is and your connection to ASAP here in the community. So thank you again for having me today, Michael. Uh, My name is Catherine Brunson. I'm a regional overdose prevention specialist, and we are housed with um, community anti-drug coalitions. So I serve an eight-county region, but I'm housed at the ASAP of Anderson Anti-Drug Coalition. So the counties that I serve are all five counties that Ridgeview's in, which is probably why we're partners all the time. I serve Morgan, Roan, Anderson, Union, Granger, Campbell, Claiborne, and Scott counties. Um, So with that being said, when people try to get in in touch with me, I try to get back just as quickly as I can, but I'm uh, back to driving around, So, and I'm glad to be doing that. And so what we do is we work with um, first responders primarily, we work with agencies, and we work with um, individuals and family members that have someone at high risk for an opioid overdose. And so we provide training for anybody that's interested Um, And even beyond um, the return to in-person events, I will continue to host some virtual trainings that anybody can attend at any time. And it's been interesting during COVID, I've had New Jersey, I've had Miami, Florida, I had someone attend from Ghana and Guam. I've had people attend from all over. So anyone can attend the training and they're more than welcome to do it. Um, I've actually been really excited that I've been able to hook up like New Jersey, Oklahoma, the Florida folks. I've found out what the resources are in in their states and have been able to connect them with with uh, the NLOC zone as well. But what we basically do is um, provide the training for help people understand um, who's at high risk for an opioid overdose, what does that overdose look like, how we can respond to it um, with the naloxone to save somebody's life. And we also briefly touch on just kind of the basic principles of harm reduction about the stigma that's associated with substance use disorder as well as with mental health disorders um, and and try to help people understand addiction a little mm-hmm. bit better to kind of understand the fact that um, there's a lot of complex factors that go into someone developing an addiction um, and it's just not something that people wake up in the morning and say you know when I get older I think I want to be an addict <laughs> it's just not how it works oh, but no. Um, It's really amazing to me, as I was training yesterday in Campbell County, a lot of first responders, um, there's still so much stigma associated with it and a a lack of understanding about all those complex factors Mm -hmm. that go into um, where someone is today. And I always say they're just trying to deal with the hand that God gave them, right? No, I think that's beautifully said. I think we... We often don't appreciate, uh, you use the word complex. We talk about the constellation of factors. They all, it's a much more complicated equation than we give it credit for. But let's take that example that you just gave. Now, is that in person? Are you starting to do the trainings in person? I I am. And it was a matter of fact, I did the entire um, Clinton city government um, I had 100 people in a room on <laughs> Tuesday, and I was like, this is the most people I've seen at one time since COVID started. Great. So, um, yes, I am doing in person. I did uh, seven departments yesterday in Campbell County. So I am very comfortable coming in person if people are comfortable having me in person. Um, I still am also doing what we call pop-up events okay. for people that might need to get don't have time to sit through the hour training, which it's about an hour, um, but need to get their hands on a kit right away because our highest risk for an opioid overdose 
um, for a fatal overdose is someone that had a non-fatal overdose already. Yep. And so we know that over 80% of the people that die of, an, of a fatal overdose had a non-fatal overdose in the previous 12 months. And it's usually the previous three or four weeks. So that's a big part of my training is I really tell people, listen out in your neighborhood, in your workplace, at church. If you hear someone talking about, oh, did you hear about Beverly's nephew? He had an overdose, but oh, good news, he didn't die. I ask people, please reach out and let them know that they have access to a Narcan kit and that we want to get it in the hands of those family members or friends around that individual as quickly as possible. Yeah. So we kind of sporadically go around to different counties where we just do a pop-up event in a parking lot. Right. Not, you know, we don't need, people don't even need to get out of their car. Well, and they can just pull up if they're worried about someone, yeah. and we can do an individual training with them and provide them with a kit. I thought that was one of the beauties. So this was pre-pandemic, but you joined Hannah Samawi and me at an event in Campbell County where we had partnered with Roger Owens and uh, a, a church, and we were uh, distributing food um, and, and some other like l- life essentials, socks, toothbrushes. But you were present to meet with people on an individual basis, uh, and I I, ju- I think that is such a a cool uh, organic like meeting people where they are literally uh so the fact that you're still able to do that i think is is wonderful so i i know data is important um i don't know if we have data related to the pandemic uh but can you what can you tell us about what you've seen pre-pandemic, current pandemic in terms of overdose? uh, Is that going up? Is it going down? Is the use of Narcan going up, down? So the first year of this grant, um, we had reported 48 fatal overdoses in Anderson County. And um, most of those were prescription drug related with a smaller percentage being heroin related. After the first year of distributing um, the Narcan kits to all of our first responders, to fire departments, police departments, as well as individuals and agencies in the community, we were so excited that we had a 48% decrease in our fatal overdoses in the second year. And then COVID came. (laughs) And honestly, we still have our 2019 data in the training that we do. But I'm telling everyone, everywhere I am, these numbers are going to be blown out of the water when we get those COVID numbers, those final numbers. So in typical, um, in a month in Anderson County, for example, I would have gotten maybe three or four reports from the sheriff's department about them using Narcan for an overdose. And in June of last year, I had 47 reports in one month. Wow. And so our non-fatal overdoses showing up at Methodist Medical Center, um, I I would say a guesstimate is for um, every one fatal that we report, and and the fatals, what's in the training data that we reveal, that we probably have an additional 15 to 20 non-fatals. So our non-fatals in 2019 in Anderson County were 165 people. Now, those are only people that bothered to get to Methodist Medical Center. So if they um, are administered and they do not transport afterwards, which a lot of people, because they might be on probation or um, be in some sort of trouble, might might not go to the hospital. So we know that those numbers are probably a little underreported as well. But those are the people that are most likely to die of an overdose. Mm. And so one of the really good things with this grant um, is they have added some lifeliners, is what they call them. And they're certified prevention recovery specialists who actually can meet with the individual or family member while they're in the emergency room um, and try to connect them with resources, too. So the grant is really multifaceted, and there's kind of a whole team of us Mm -hmm. that work in different capacities. We have faith-based coordinators who are just in particularly trying to do the training and reaching out to the faith community. I do churches too, but I mean, that's their role is to help people kind of understand that addiction, build some recovery supports within the churches. Um, 
and then working with our lifeliners and our certified prevention yeah. specialists. We're, we're kind of like a little team group that goes yeah. in together. And your team at Ridgeview has been incredible. Um, Hannah and Kaylee both came with me to a pop-up in Harriman not too long ago, and we are going back to meet with Roger and Common Grounds yes. at the end of the month, um, and we're trying right now to get one scheduled in Morgan County. Um, Morgan County, I have to say, is, is the my most challenging county that I'm really having a hard time getting into. So if anyone's listening to this, please yeah. invite me to Morgan County. I really, I'm ready to come and wanting to come. Right. Um, because we have seen, I would say over um, the last six months or so, um, Anderson and Roan have been my highest uh, reports on overdoses. Um, and then it's just moved a little bit into Campbell and Morgan as well. So yeah. those are my highest hit counties um, where I'm trying to spend more time. Okay. So, I mean, I, you, you sort of touched on this a little bit earlier, but let's get to that resistant uh, or hard to uh, uh, populations maybe hard to enter into uh, and stigma. So our, it seems like, you know, we're seeing the needle move, but there's still a lot of work yet to be done with the stigma around uh, prevention efforts, around uh, the use of Narcan, uh, how people got to a place of overdose to begin with. Uh, are you, is that just me, uh, being too hopeful and idealistic or are you seeing the needle move a little bit? I, I have seen the needle move a little bit because in the first year when I was contacting, we started with our first responders. And so I would contact a lot of law enforcement agencies and they would say, uh, uh-uh, we're not doing that. And so then a lot of departments did pick it up, right? And so they started getting some positive publicity for serving the community. Um, and so then I had some come to me in, you know, kind of 18 months into the grant and say, hey, we wanted some, we want some of that too. And I said, well, you turned it down before. So their attitudes are changing yeah. a little bit as they see other um, law enforcement agencies that are doing it. Yeah. And we provide resources for them to leave behind with that individual or family member too. And I'm very proud of our, our law enforcement and fire departments who are really really trying to serve the yeah. community in a great way you know, um so I, yes i think we are yeah. we are moving on the needle a little bit yeah. um one of the things that i always ask when we were in person uh, and i did it in clinton is getting started i'll say how many of you know someone living in recovery and so usually it's at least half the room that will raise their hands and about 10 percent of the adult population in the united states is living in recovery and so i tell them that's what i'm trying to do we are trying to provide Narcan to keep someone alive long enough that we can move them along that behavior change cycle and get them into that beautiful mm -hmm. place of treatment and recovery. Yeah. And so then that kind of clicks a little bit. We're not trying to enable people's drug use, mm -hmm. but we're right. trying to keep them alive long yeah. enough to move them along that behavior change process and get them into yeah. recovery. No, that's beautifully said. I love the way you said it. I can see a future op-ed uh, shaped around that. But in February, I was with the La Follette Fire Department, uh, hat off to Chief uh, Jimmy Pack, uh, and I asked them, uh, my training was on uh, stress management, uh, compassion fatigue, those kinds of things, and uh, I, I said, you know, man, I, I remember as a youngster, long time ago, that uh, fire departments worked on fires and they said yeah uh, 95 percent of what we get called out to are medicals mm -hmm. and i was like medicals what's what's a medical and it is overdose a, f a fall uh cardiac arrest cardiac arrest mm -hmm. loneliness I mean, you know people that call to get someone to come out to their home because so yeah i the fact that the target are these you know first responders ems uh, fire department law enforcement uh i can see why that would be a a huge focal point uh if folks are interested in they're listening to this. They're like, oh, yeah, I want to have Catherine come to our church, our school, our business, and do this training. What should they do? 
So the, the best way is actually to get on our website, which is asapofanderson.org. And so on there, they will find the virtual trainings that are already scheduled. They can also fill out a form to request a training. And so one of the, I'm glad you said businesses. Um, one of the uh, areas I'm trying to reach out to a little bit more right now is to reach out to people and provide that training while they're in the workplace. So I was so glad when the uh, HR department in the city of Clinton said, I want you to train everybody. And so since then, I've gone to my contact in Scotts County, Scott County, and I'm doing all of the Hunt city of Huntsville. Um, and so that's going to be an outreach that I'm going to be trying to do. But in particular, we know certain um, uh, segments like manufacturing and construction um, and the inter- uh, entertainment and hospitality industries are a little bit higher on our scale for having substance use issues. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would love to try to get out to those places mm-hmm. and try to help uh, educate people and make sure that they are aware of access points mm-hmm. on how they can get it. Um, one point that we want to make, uh, I think that's really important, whether people attend the training or not, is to know that um, the naloxone is so safe that it is the only medication that you can walk into a participating pharmacy like CVS, Walgreens, Walmart, and anyone can ask the pharmacist for naloxone without a doctor's prescription. Um, and so there are uh, different variations of the, the naloxone um, that are much less expensive than the Narcan that we provide. So you can get an atomizer or an intramuscular injection um, for less than $10. Wow. So we want people to be aware of that, that everyone has access and anyone can access it as well at a pharmacy. Yeah, no, that's great. We'll put the link in the comments section to the website uh, where people can learn more about the current schedule or make a request. Um, Having been through the training, just a little tip and teaser for y'all. Catherine does a great job. Uh, You can tell she's high energy, uh, so she makes it... uh, uh, it's a, a life-giving, no pun intended, training, so I encourage folks to, to check it out. Uh, so I told you I would conclude with this question, since you just love self-care so much. So <laughs> how does Catherine take care of Catherine? You, you do hard work, and a lot of it can be very depressing, sad, sorrowful, heartbreaking work. Uh, you've highlighted the beauty of the program is transitioning people to a life of recovery. But how do you take care of yourself? So what really catches people with substance use disorder and drugs is that dopamine release, right? The dopamine release from drugs is like a thousand times a normal, healthy dopamine release. So we can get some normal, healthy dopamine releases by going outside and exercising, and you get an even double bonus if you put your earbuds in, you listen to some music that you really like. And so that is my my trigger is, um, and I'll be honest, I, I had... <laughs> A department who I love, don't get me wrong, but they sent me a whole lot of overdose reports on one day. And so I sat putting them in for about four hours. And around that last hour, I just felt a little tear rolling down my face because this is a community I've worked with for a long time. And mentally in my head, I was counting up the fatal ones. And so it just kind of went like this. And so I just texted everyone in my office and I said, I got to check out for today, folks. And so I had to just unplug. I turned my phone off. I went outside. I walked till my couldn't walk anymore and listened to music. And mm-hmm. that is kind of what, you know, even better if you can do it up in the Smoky Mountains. But that wasn't an option that day. Um, but, you know, just getting yeah. out in nature, getting that, that dopamine release we mm-hmm. get from exercise, um, listening to some music, mm-hmm. and then, you know, follow it up some good fried chicken or pizza, and you're good to go. All <laughs> right. All right. Sounds like a recipe for wellness. I'm all about it. Uh, that's probably a perfect place for us to end. I really appreciate you coming in. It's great to see you again. Uh, please come back. Uh, we'll talk about whatever you want. Uh, folks, I appreciate you tuning in once again. Uh, please don't forget to subscribe, ring the bell so that you get notification of our latest episode. Take good care of yourself and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.